For those of you joining, we're gonna give it about a minute or two, let everyone come on into the room and then we will begin. Thank you for, thank you for coming on. Okay, I see uh, it's slowed down. Uh, we'll begin. Uh, good afternoon or evening, everyone. I want to th thank everyone for joining us today in our con continuation of our safety webinar series. My name is Lily Calderon, Director of Health and Safety Programs for the International. I'm joined today by Dave Waisaki, MTEF National Safety Director, and Ryan Plucknett, our AV specialist. Uh, the the construction industry is a very physical demand, physically demanding, and it has its own set of hazards like falls, electrocution, struck by, caught in, or in between, and hazards that you may not be able to see physically, but our industry has hazards that may not be present themselves till years later. Like hearing, with overexposure to noise, high noise, we may notice it in later years, our depletion of hearing, or maybe even deafness. As the same may happen with exposure to certain chemicals and dust. We might not be aware of the effects of certain chemicals and or dust till much later after the exposure, which is why today we have a special guest speaker who is conducting a study on lung function screening in construction workers exposed to dust and chemicals. Early detection is critical to protecting ourselves and our members from potential hazards and its effects on our health. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Kathleen Kathy Clark, who works as a health scientist and research epidem epidemiologist in the respiratory health Division at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Institution, Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH. She has worked at NIOSH since 2016. At NIOSH, she has been a project officer for NIOSH's National Spirometry Training Program and Spirometry Team Lead for the Coal Workers Health Surveillance Program. She has been the pulmonary subject matter expert for the Wildland Firefighter Exposure and Health Effects Study conducted by NIOSH in partnership with the U.S. Forest Service. With over 20 years experience as a registered respiratory therapist and 15 years of public health service, she has worked directly with migrant farm workers, textile industry workers, and community members exposed to toxic chemical accidental releases. Her career commitment has been to help reduce the suffering of others because of their inability to breathe. Thank you, Dr. Clark, for joining us today and sharing your research study, and we hope that we can help move the study along. And now, before we begin today's webinar, <clears throat> I would like to go over some housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on our website, bacweb.org forward slash safety, as well as all past webinars. We will have a question and answer section at the conclusion of our presentation. Please use the Q&A box to submit questions during the presentation and or at the end. We will get to them in the Q&A session. And as always, please feel free to submit any recommendations for future webinars. Thank you all. And with that, we will begin. Dr. Clark, you have the floor. Thank you, Lily. And uh, thank you everyone who's here uh, and attending today's webinar. I'm honored to be able to discuss with you some of my uh, some of the research that I plan on conducting and working with uh, brick masons and block masons. Um, so anyways, thank you so much for having me tonight. And uh, if anyone has any questions throughout my presentation, feel free to, you know, just raise your hand or, or whatnot, plus with the Q&A after. So tonight what I want to do is I want to introduce you to a NIOSH research st uh, study that we're working in partnership with the CPWR in order to conduct uh, and look at, uh, at bricklayers' lung health. Next slide, please, Ryan. So the study that's being conducted by NIOSH is entitled Lung Function Screening in Construction Workers Exposed to Dusts and Chemicals. 
Um, it's fully funded by NIOSH and we plan on actually, it's currently under board review, uh, going through human subjects review and paperwork reduction act. But as soon as we get through with that, we'll end up, uh, we'll end up actually conducting the field study. Uh, tonight, what I want to talk about is basically why we chose bricklayers in order to incorporate them in this study, then, then uh, explain uh, why we, the thoughts and the goals of this project, as well as uh, the rationale behind the project. Then I want to discuss different uh, uh, technical procedures that we're going to use within the study, and then um, just familiarize yourself, uh, uh, all of you, with all of the criteria and ask you to participate or uh, pass, pass it on, so to speak. So with that, next sli slide, please, Brian. So when we think of construction workers, we think a lot about falls and impact and and you know repetitive repetitive motion um, uh, injuries and that type of things. And with today's you know respirators and all the regulations behind like the silica dust rule and and things like that, you know you may not be as aware of the hazards that or the risks that you impose yourself as you work on your day-to-day -day, uh, work day. So with that, uh, we wanted to look at construction workers and lung disease. So exposures to, you know, silica and other toxic dusts and chemicals actually put construction workers at higher risk for developing chronic lung diseases. And I think everyone is quite aware of it. Uh, however, if you look at some of the basic statistics, it's kind of, um, it's kind of sh shocking in a way just how much lung disease can be attributed to exposures and that type of thing. And we, we really understand that it really is underdiagnosed within the working setting. So OSHA estimate, estimates that approximately 2 million construction workers at over 600,000 work sites are occupationally exposed to substances like silica that can lead to cancer, uh, COPD or emphysema or chronic lung disease. So if we look at some of the studies that have been done in the past and we look at them and we compare lung disease and construction workers to uh, the general population within the US, we go to a, a, a NIH study called uh, NHANES, the National Health and Nutritional Environmental Survey. And it's conducted each year and it's a large general population study within the US. So from data from 2007 to 2012, we actually had data in there of people all over the United States uh, about 30,000 individuals who were sampled and who performed pulmonary function testing and looked at their lung health. When we looked at their lung health and we looked at the data from this survey, almost 18% of people who were ever employed within the construction industry actually had what we call airway obstruction or fixed airway obstruction. Of that, 20% 20 20 of construction laborers and the construction trade helpers had chronic airway obstruction. And if we break it down into brick masons and block masons and uh, you know the extraction kind of occupations, 13.3% actually had uh, COPD or airway obstruction. So you say, well, that doesn't that doesn't seem like a lot, but it really is when you compare it to the general population. Within these studies, on average, only 6.5% of people within the U.S. actually have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, compared to almost double that for brick masons and cement, uh, cement makers and boiler makers and steel workers. So with that, we're saying 
your exposure to these mixed dusts and these fumes and chemicals could actually be con uh, contribute contributing. Regardless of smoking, we really have to take a strong look at uh, your exposure and what you're being exposed to day in, day out throughout your careers. So next slide, please. So with that, I want to discuss the study that I'm currently conducted, conducting. I was funded in 2022, and I've been busy kind of developing partnerships. I'm working with people and discussing with people and developing a team in order to uh, form collaborations through, throughout the industry in order to get this study going. The, it's a pilot study, which means it's only the beginning. We're just getting a relatively small sample of individuals. And what the primary goal of this study is to look at this new technology out there called impulse oscillometry and see if we can actually identify early stage obstructive airflow or a, a condition known as small airways dysfunction within construction workers within your industry. We'll use iOS to determine if this condition is associated with any of the symptoms that you might have as you're being exposed to dusts and, and fumes and mixed dust and mixed substances. And then we'll also look at employee ten uh, employment tenure. Basically, if you've worked as a Brick Mason for 20 years, are you at greater risk for developing uh, you know, lung disease or chronic lung disease that can detrimentally affect your well-being? So from the start, we wanted to look at two separate groups. You know, you, you guys, uh, 150 of bricklayers or block masons who are predominantly exposed to the dusts and the finer du dusts and silicates and that, and also welders. And welders are exposed to a lot of metals and, fume, and fumes. So it might not be as dusty as a trade, but they, they do get exposure also. So We'll be going through, as I said, review processes for the remainder of this year. And also I'll be going out and performing outreach to people who might want to participate or identify uh, collection sites or identify work sites that might want to participate in this study and, and see if, if we can form this partnership between NIOSH and, and get this going. So but recruitment and actual sampling and testing will occur within uh, between February 2025 and September of 2025. And we're hoping to first charge ahead with you, with your job, with your occupational group, and look at bricklayers and black masons and 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 perform study uh, or perform testing on on you and then move on on the latter part of of the summer or such and look at welders next slide please so when when i i said all this gibberish and talked about small airways dysfunction versus copd and emphysema excuse me emphysema, but what is small airways dysfunction? It's got a specific, it, let me take you through the actual kind of anatomy of a lung and how we look at the lung. So you have the lung tissue and the lung itself, and that's where the oxygen go and carbon dioxide goes in and out of the bloodstream. But leading to and actually acting like a conduit is your what we call your tracheal bronchial tree, which consists of a series of airways, just open airways that start in the trachea or at the windpipe. I'm trying to get my marker here. 
Okay. At the windpipe, and then we branch into the right and the left lung, and then we continue to branch as we get further and further and further down, down this system. The branching actually leads to a narrowing and, uh, and of the bronchial tree. And it, each branch or each little branching actually comes becomes smaller and smaller in diameter. And the reason for that is, you know, so by the time we get down to what we call generations or 23 splits down from the trachea down to the lung itself, these airways are what's considered small airways. And they're less than two millimeters in diameter. And just like little small bits of air can go through them. So that, that what happens with all that branching is it creates this surface area in the lungs that just helps with oxygen and carbon dioxide to be exchanged over the lung itself. So it's a very highly efficient thing. The thing is, is where you start to develop disease from our lung disease is you start, you usually start way down here. These areas like, like down in generation 16, 17 to 19, these are very, very, very small airways and they're very sensitive to small fine dusts and these toxic chemicals and these fumes. So when I talk about small airway dysfunction, I'm talking about it's not really disease because it's often reversible, but within these small, small branches leading into the lungs. Next slide, please. So in a normal healthy airway, if you took these really small, small airways, you have basically the, the interior of this little small airway and every airway is surrounded by muscle. And this muscle has the ability to constrict and make the inner diameter of this tube smaller or keep it big or it can dilate and keep it really big. So what happens is when you inhale these dust, say you inhale silica from grinding or cutting rock, or it's just a, a dusty area that you're working in. It might be enclosed, it might be open, but there might be a lot of, you know, cutting and, and all that throughout. And even just pouring cement, you know, all the sands from dry cement before you liquefy it and that kind of thing. So what happens is over time, you're, you're inhaling this, you might not have the proper respiratory protection on, and you're inhaling this. And what happens is there's mucosa, like the mucosa in the inner side of your mouth, it actually starts to swell and become inflamed. And then the person starts to wheeze and they start to develop phlegm and you start to develop a cough. Well, all of that leads to the narrowing and the narrowing of the lumen of this tube, thereby not allowing air to pass through as freely. So you're not getting the air that's necessary to go to the lung to help you pick up oxygen and release carbon dioxide. And with that, you know, over time, this inflammation, we all hear about inflammation these days and how inflammation leads to disease. Well, that's true. So chronic inflammation, inflammation over years and years and years of exposure can actually, um, can actually be detrimental. And that's how, next slide, please. We think that lung disease progresses. So at first you show up at a job site, you're very healthy, you're young, you're 18, you're, you know, you're doing your thing, you're doing your work, you're invincible. And so you're on the job for a couple of years or so, and you start developing these symptoms, these respiratory symptoms. And the respiratory symptoms are things like cough, with sputum production. You might feel yourself wheezing from time to time. I'm actually wheezing because I have asthma and I have my allergies going. Um, wheezing from time to time, uh, or you um, 
develop shortness of breath or you notice you're not walking when you walk up hills you become more winded than you normally are and as we go through our lives we say oh I'm getting old I'm putting on weight I'm doing this but that might not necessarily be so so anyways first people develop symptoms and then the next next step of progression of disease is looking at the small airways dysfunction. As I said, these airways become inflamed, they have mucus in them, they're not moving air through as quickly as possible, and they're in the real small distal parts of the lung. So it's really hard to measure them. Now, all of this at this stage is very reversible. And it's very easily to be reversed. You know, you might need an inhaler. You might not, you know, you might not. Um, but your cells aren't being damaged quite yet. They're inflamed, but they're not necessarily damaged. As we move into actually asthma and occupational asthma from inhaling all the dusts and the fumes throughout your career, you can actually develop long-term asthma. And if that's the case, you're after a period of years, and this might be over decades, after a period of years, those who are susceptible to these dusts and fumes and conditions actually can develop like cell changes within the airways and themselves, so much so that it becomes more and more dysfunctional. You can still usually reverse the asthma or actually reduce symptoms and make you breathe, but you still might have be having cellular changes. Then as the years turn into decades and you keep, and you're one of those individuals, maybe you know one out of every five individuals are susceptible to, to the dusts and the fumes, you're one of those individuals, you start to develop the more long-term lung problems, COPD or emphysema. And that's where it's irreparable. I mean, it's what we what we call fixed dysfunction. You have disease and it's only going to progress, maybe slowly, but it's going to progress and progress and progress throughout the rest of your lifetime. And then if, you know, nothing's done about it and we just don't catch it in time, you can develop disability. And I think each and every one of us have known people, I've worked with coal workers and they're like the classic example of people who, who you know, over the years, they become totally disabled with black lung and all of that. So what our goal here at NIOSH is actually to prevent that from happening. We don't want you to develop COPD. We don't want you to develop disability. We want to prevent any of that. And the best way in doing that is to actually coming way back here and identifying when you're, when you're showing susceptibility. And if we can develop techniques to do that, we can actually prevent you from going down this whole entire path. So that's kind of the idea behind my research project that I want to, that I want to introduce to you tonight. So next slide, please. So everyone has heard, I think probably here on this webinar, has heard of, uh, you know, the silica dust rule. And depending on if you're one of those people who has to routinely wear a respirator, you may be required to perform pulmonary function testing. And I think, you know, thank you. Each of us has, has done pulmonary function testing before, and it's basically what we call spirometry. And spirometry is that, and I think every one of us has seen it, has known someone who's done it, um, is, is that lung function test that <clears throat> actually here in NIOSH, we make you stand up for but you stand up or you sit down, you put nose clips on. Someone tells you to take a great big deep breath in and take the biggest, deepest breath you can in, hold it and then blast it out quick. And so you, and you, we make you blow, 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 blow until you feel like you're gonna pass out and then have you take another deep breath in. So it's something like, <sighs> Oh, 
And so not all people can do that. And not all people can do that repetitively. And not all, and some people, people who've had pneumothoraces before, people who've had, you know, lung, uh, certain lung problems before or heart problems before can't necessarily do that. It takes a maximum amount of effort. So that's one of the things that we say, if we could only get a test that's easier to perform. Also, the thing about spirometry is, as I said, we have 23 splits as we go down as, you know, the air flows through the bronchial tree to go to the lung. Well, spirometry actually measures the mechanical function of, of the airflow moving throughout your respiratory system. So when you take a great, it, it tells us how deeply you can breathe and how quickly you can blow out the air. But it is not necessarily a great test to actually be able to identify the location of the dysfunction. It says somewhere within here, maybe, you know, at generations eight to 12, you, um, you, you're having some dysfunction. So you can progress along and have more and more disease because we're not able to get down to those 16, 17, 18 generations and actually identify that they're inflamed. So, so if we could find a different technique that actually could literally isolate out those small airways and say, this is where things are just starting. It would be what I want to introduce. Next slide, please, Ryan. Next slide. So there is a new technology out. It's called impulse oscillometry. And it's much more sensitive of a test. It actually is able to find the location of the dysfunction of airflow in those real small airways. You, we can actually isolate between the small airways and the larger airways with this test. And you say, wow, this is great. And it doesn't take a whole lot of effort. So people can basically do this test and do it with minimal amount of effort reliably, and it's pretty easy to do. So, so let's say maybe in the future, we can identify dysfunction earlier, plus make it an easier test for you guys to perform and thereby actually help you to breathe easier and be healthier for throughout your lifetime and, and not go down this path to COPD, but actually stop you right here. So with that, I wanna, can I click? I can't, uh, I have a small, video, and I must admit it's a little embarrassing, but this is another project I was on years ago. So if you could play that, Ryan. This is called an oscillometry. Sometimes people who cannot take that big forceful deep breath in because you, your exhale. Whoa, did that cut off? is called an oscillometry. Sometimes people who cannot take that big forceful deep breath in because you, you're exhaling really hard and you start to cough and that kind of thing. Well, recently what's come out is called an IOS, an oscillometer. Usually with regular pulmonary function testing, we uh, cannot measure how well air moves in and out of the small airways directly. Oscillometry uh, helps us to do that. Uh, so we are looking to see whether people who have been exposed to um, chlorine may in fact have problems moving air in and out of the small airways uh, in a way that might not be detected by the usual pulmonary function test. All you're going to do is sit on this thing, put your hands to your cheeks, and pant 
and then breathe normal because air goes in your jowls. <laughs> so we don't want that. So you have to put your hands like this for 30 seconds and just breathe in and out normally. Okay, Ryan. So I, I'm rather embarrassed, but anyways. So with that, we want to. I want to use this technology and see if we can actually develop some kind of procedure in order to actually identify this small airways dysfunction in workers with normal spirometry, a normal pulmonary function test, and then we're going to connect it to respiratory symptoms, and then how long you've worked within, within your job. So the overreaching goal of this pilot study is to, be re to reliably identify workers at risk for developing chronic lung disease at an earlier stage when it's the most often reversible. So you don't have to go down that pathway. Next slide, please. So who can participate in this study? Men, women, anyone working who's currently working within the construction industry for at least one year between the age of, of 18 and 65 years of age. You can have asthma that will be asking you a series of questions just to identify whether you had asthma as a kid, you might not be able to and have had it all your life. You might not, like myself, you might not be able to participate because I've had asthma since I was at a young age. But if you've recently started as an adult to, to have asthma, we, we want to capture you because sometimes, or we want to test you because sometimes asthma might be occupational asthma rather than just asthma per se. So all races, all ethnicities, brick masons or black masons who have had tenure of at least one year. And these are the groups that I'm looking at, the associate groups of, you know, BLS 47, dash two zero one. So anyways, um, next slide, please, Ryan. But who cannot participate? Because the idea is to identify those workers who have normal spirometry. You can't really have a lot of, you know, already identified and diagnosed disease. So if you've already been diagnosed with COPD or pneumoconiosis or asbestosis, we can't really, because I'd be looking at something different. I want to get that worker who actually doesn't have any history of disease. If you have chronic heart disease, the heart and the lungs work in conjunction with each other. If you've had a history of an MI or you have, you know, you have blocked arteries going to the heart, we, we, I definitely don't want, you know, they work in conjunction. So some of your pulmonary function results can be because of heart disease per se in certain instances. And you know, I don't want to cloud things up with a lot of smoking. Please, you can be a smoker. That's no problem. But the thing is, because I don't think, you know, almost 20% of disease is, is, is not related to smoking. 15 to 20% of all lung disease is not related to smoking. So I'm not really emphasizing smoking. We'll want to make sure that, you know, if you're a smoker, you tell us, but as long as you haven't smoked a pack a day for over, say, 15 years, then you would not be uh, eligible. Plus, if you have really high blood pressure, you you won't be eligible because that, that may cause some problems. And women who are in their third trimester, that would that would botch up some pulmonary function testing. So we want fairly on the younger side, any age is welcome, but on the younger side who don't, doesn't have these chronic diseases. Next slide, please. So how, how is this going to come about? So this is, this is for the next 
six months or so, as I said, I want to reach out. I want to reach out to work sites. I want to reach out to you as workers. I want to reach out and say, let you know that this is happening. And in some time in, I, I would say February, we actually want to, we want to actually come out, the team wants to come out and actually test you. So we'll, we'll provide information to you before we even show up. Plus this, in 2024, I want to visit those work sites or union halls or places that we might be able to set up pulmonary function testing for, for individuals so we can work with people and have a nice, you know, concentrated area to get you guys in and out as quickly as possible. So with that, we have informational flyers and you can you can contact me at any time. We can send you stuff out. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. So after we develop and we say, this is where we're going to be testing for the next six, nine months. Next slide, please. We'll, we'll show up as a team and we'll arrive at the study test site and we'll, that's to be determined. And then we'll go through a real quick, you know, five minute checklist. We'll give you a checklist that you can read over. And even before you commit or even you might be interested, you go through this checklist and you say, oh, I have this. I can't take this. So, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to participate. But if you are, I would ask you to, you know, really, really please uh, volunteer if you can for this study. This would be a wonderful thing because the whole goal is to help people early on before they develop disability. So then if you say, okay, I, I, can, I can join this, we'll take you through an informed consent process. And this informed consent process will explain everything to you, everything you want to know about the study, about what we do with the data, get all of your consents, whether even if we want to take a picture or not of you, you can, you can at any time say no. Then once you're thorough, all your questions are answered, we'll bring you to the actual testing. We'll take your height, your blood pressure, your weight, that will take a few minutes. Then there's a study questionnaire, and it's not a big one. It's a three part questionnaire that there's like eight questions in each part. One's about your job history. Do you wear a respirator? Do you not? How long have you worked as a bricklayer? That kind of thing. Then your respiratory symptoms, as I say, do you wheeze? Do you have shortness of breath? And then your smoking history and a light one. I mean, just like, do you smoke? Have you smoked? How, how much have you smoked? Kind of thing. And very, you know, not specific. Then you go into the pulmonary function testing. In order for me to actually validate the impulse oscillometry like I want to, we have to provide, we have to do spirometry testing so I can compare the two tests in order to make changes within, as you know, the government or any anything, in order to make changes to help you guys out, we have to prove that this way might be better or it might work well with spirometry. So we're going to perform the spirometry where you have to take a great big deep breath in, have to blow it out, and then, and then we'll go and do the oscillometry. So all of this will take about 45 minutes to one hour of your time. Next slide, please. Ryan? Okay. Finally, I just want to let you know, the study is completely voluntary. You can volunteer. You can drop out at any time. You can do some tests. You can do no test. Well, you have to do some tests. You can do. You can stop and say no. I want to do this at any time with no repercussion whatsoever. And also, everyone's worried about their data these days. And CDC actually does what's called a certificate of confidentiality, which is above and beyond any of the legal uh, requirements that we need in order to protect your data. So this prevents us from releasing any information to anyone about you and your testing, unless you give me written, written approval. I have to get your approval unless there's a big pandemic or something like that, who knows. But uh, 
you know, if the feds come in and say you must report, but but that's rare and it's very, I mean, it's very well protected. Um, your employer, your union rep will not be given your individual results. We'll do a summary and we'll provide the information for everyone to read and see, but it will be an aggregate form and no one will be able to, you know, look back and look at any of your information. They won't know who, con who contributed or whatnot. Unfortunately, yeah, as you know, some parts of the government is operating on a shoestring and NIOSH is one of those parts. So we cannot, I cannot offer you any monetary compensation for this. And I apologize for that because I know an hour of your time is important. However, you're doing a good service and you're helping future bricklayers out and preventing disease. So it's kind of an altruistic thing, but we will actually interpret your pulmonary function tests and we'll actually mail out the results, your individual results out to you at your request or to your healthcare provider if you want us to share that with it. So at least you get, you know, a few hundred dollars worth of testing done for free. Other than that, um, I'm sorry, we can't offer you any compensation. So next slide, slide please. So with that, are there any questions? And here's my contact information. And please feel free to reach out and, and any question and any, you know, if you're interested and you just want to talk about the feasibility of you participating. I know there's union reps on. I know there's individuals on, individual workers on. And I know there's, you know, private industry uh, representatives on too. So if any work site or any individual um, is interested, please feel free or has any additional questions, feel free to contact me. With that, I'll entertain any questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Clark. Um, you know, this research that you're conducting will help uh, future bricklayers, bricklayers that are just starting out, and possibly bricklayers that have been in the industry for a while, right? Uh, oh. By early detection, uh, I think early detection and in, in lung capacity and what our lungs are doing and are exposed to, uh, it's 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 a great thing, right? Because the earlier we know if something is wrong or going wrong, the the better we are apt to mitigate those things, right? Mm -hmm. um, not knowing years later is, you know, it, it's not good because by that time you've already had the illness or are living with it. And like you said, there's no way to come back from that. Right. right. Um, so I think your study here has, uh, has a lot of potential to save many, many lives and the, the ways that people live their lives. And I think that's, really my emphasis. So it's great to save lives and we have all this technology and all these medications and things like that to help people and all uh, to help people out. But once you reach a certain point, it's progressive. You're going to have it the rest of your life. So, you know, I think we should really emphasize, you know, and I, I would like to get, you know, things places like OSHA and all these other things actually emphasizing the idea of Let's catch the people who can benefit the most and don't shoot them into having lung disease 20 years down the road, as you said. Absolutely. And um, using the I iOS, is that still very, very new? Uh, does anyone really use it as a, uh, a way to detect lung function? Well, iOS has been out since like the 1980s, but it's more been like scientific use and that kind of thing, a really niche group. So it started to be used clinically, especially once again, Europe has been using it clinically since probably about somewhere in the 2003 to 2010. Um, and the US is starting to catch on predominantly in the U.S., it's, were, it's used with um, 
kids, kids who can't perform pulmonary function testing, these young five-year-olds who have, you know, that kind of thing. So it's worked in the clinic, it's, it's being seen in the big pulmonary function labs and the clinical labs. They're using it a lot with kids. However, and it's gaining more and more steam throughout the US. However, it's had very limited use within the occupational arena. And I think the occupational arena is perfect because, you know, up to date, Lily, what we've done is we look at coal workers. So we know, you know, we look at the substance, but there's so many people out there who actually are exposed to so many different substances. So rather than go in and do this million dollar project on what exactly every human being is exposed to, you know, look at what's going to benefit people the most and look at identifying how that individual worker can prevent from getting lung disease. And that's kind of the emphasis. So it's gaining more. And I think more and more people are starting to look at. But like I say, this is why it's a pilot study. If we get supportive information, we'll be able to advance it forward, hopefully. And But my goal would be to, in 20 years down the road, actually maybe have that as part of medical surveillance so you can, in a vast array of occupations, actually prevent people from having lung disease or occupational lung disease. That's great. Uh, we did get one question more on, I guess, protection. Just your thoughts about half face respirator while mixing cement or gunite. And respirators are great. And PPE, proper PPE and proper use of PPE can prevent lots and lots of things. The thing is, is sometimes I know I worked with wildland firefighters, you know, and I worked with smoke jumpers and these smoke jumpers had to run up 3000 feet. And, you know, I mean, they had to huff and puff and, you know, not, not, not even a self-contained unit. Nothing could meet their demand for their work of breathing. So a lot of them put handkerchiefs on, wet their handkerchiefs and just run up a hill. And yet they're inhaling all these things. So respirators are great when they meet the demand of the worker. But in all likelihood, I mean, we've had coal worker surveillance on for 20 plus years now, right? And yet, and yet with all of this information and all of this lung function testing, people are still getting pneumoconiosis because there's times, you know, people aren't perfect. People don't like things in the hot, sweaty. They want to take it off. And even if they do when they're mixing cement and there's powder dust and everything like that, you know, after you walk away and you, you know, you there's still dust in the air that you might not be able to see, or you just have to cut one block or 10 bricks and there's still a little bit of dust and you have all of the wet down and all of that, all of those, you know, protective mitigative, you know, technical devices to help you out, but there's still dust in the air and you could be still getting exposed to the dust. And those are the things, the particles that you can't see are actually the most dangerous to you. So, you know, so what, you know, don't, stop using protection. But, you know, there are times and every one of us knows it, that it's not a perfect situation and you still may be getting exposed. And it may take you 20 years, it may take you 30 years, but you still could be having occupational exposures that could lead to, you know, poor lung health. We have a, another question. Um, smoking was highlighted in the presentation. Is vaping classified under smoking or is there different testing or studies for vaping versus traditional smoking when it comes to data collection? When we say smoking, we're going to ask you if you vape also. Um, you know, at one time, depending upon the delivery device, it's really dependent upon, and, you know, and the type of delivery device for vaping and 
please, if you vape, don't use, this is my own personal thing, don't use flavors. You know, tobacco, get your tobacco fix through vaping if you have to, but if you can do it without flavors, more and more literature is out there that's showing that vaping could actually scar the lungs rather than create this inflammation. So, um, but we'll ask you if you're vape, but we're not concentrating on, you know, and there is a formula that equates number of cigarette smoke to how much vaping you're doing. I think it's like 200 puffs of vaping is equal to a pack of cigarettes from my perspective. So we'll do all of that, you know, math for you. And yeah, we'll just say, how many puffs do you do a day? And how long have you been vaping kind of thing? Dave, any thoughts, questions? Uh, just, uh, she, you know, she's saying bricklayers and, you know, obviously we're open, it is going to be open up to the PCC members also. Yeah. Um, you know, so we will be reaching out once we come down. I, we kind of picked out the training centers that we're going to hit. Um, once we come down with that, we will uh, hope we'll send information out and hopefully we can get Kathy all the people she needs. Um, oh, so, that'd be wonderful, Bill. But no, definitely an excellent uh, opportunity here for, you know, us to help you out, you know, get this research and hopefully it'll change the way we have to do the testing and get that early uh, lung. Yeah. Um, and hopefully help the workers out. I mean, that's yes. really. And that's what know, it's all about. Yeah. It's really all about that. And that's, and I really appreciate everyone's help and commitment to that because that's what's important. But um, any other questions? So as you can see, I'm kind of passionate about the lungs. <laughs> and I, I thank all of you for your time spent and um, especially after work, probably. <laughs> But um, please well, know to contact me. But, you know, thank you, Dr. Clark, for coming on and, you know, showing us the study you're doing. Like I said, this is, this could be life changing, right? Early detection, as I said, it can be life changing. Well, um, that's it. You know, and, we, and we really appreciate you and we hope that we are able to assist you in, the, in your research uh, going forward. And I think everybody else, I, I think everyone here that came on and is uh, participating um, for coming on and, you know, hearing what, what Dr. Clark has said and hope that, you know, we can give her uh, the support that she needs. I mean, this is something that can help each and every one of us and our members and your workers. If you're a contractor and you're on here, it be for your workers as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you again, you. Dr. Clark. Thank you. Thank you guys. So, okay, well, have a pleasant night and uh, you get a few minutes back early, I think. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Good night. We'll see you on the next big one. Good night. Thank you.